Uh, we've seen Carol before talking about the Google Summer of Code. I'm sure that's a, uh, a pretty large and complex project to manage. I'm sure she's got uh, a lot of uh, advice for us. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this, is a, this is a fun Friday talk. Um, it's intended to be a little tongue-in-cheek, a little lighthearted. So uh, just uh, some, some things that I've, I've learned over my career, some, some interesting things I've observed. Um, hopefully, you'll uh, find some some interesting takeaways for yourself in your in your job. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about myself. You probably already know a little bit about me, but um, I obviously I work at Google. Um, I am a program manager, and I am currently administering the Google Summer of Code program uh, in the Open Source Programs Office. Um, I have a I have an interesting Google story. Um, I was actually hired as an, as an administrative assistant uh, about five and a half years ago now. And uh, it, ironically enough, I, uh, I, had a, I was an employee referral. My friend uh, submitted my resume, and I didn't hear anything for three months. And I figured, didn't get the job. And uh, three months later, a recruiter emailed and said, hey, would you like to come in for an on-site interview? And I said, sure, that sounds great. 11 interviews later, <laughs> I was given a job there. <laughs> um, the, the interview structure has changed since then, but uh, yeah, I, was, I went through 11 interviews to actually get a contracting position, um, and then I was finally converted over to a full-time employee three, <laughs> three months later. Um, so I did administrative assistant work for a year um, in our engineering, our site reliability group um, for a gentleman named Ben Trainer. Some of you might be familiar with him. And then I um, started to look around at other opportunities and found that there was a project management position available in our network operations group. And I knew nothing about networks. The extent of my network knowledge at the time was I knew what an IP address was. Um, and I had no prior experience actually doing any project management. Uh, so I was a perfect candidate for the job. <laughs> um, but I, um, I kind of went into this interesting kind of logistics project management hybrid job in network operations and basically learned everything on the job, um, including how to try and work with engineers. Um, and so I did that for a couple years, and that was a lot of fun, and I learned a ton about networks. Um, I know more about networks now than I thought I ever would or probably ever will need to. Um, and then I moved up uh, to our San Francisco office uh, and did some work in our some enterprise software um, um, development that we had been doing. We had recently acquired Postini, if any of you are familiar with them, and I did some project management work with them um, on their software development. And then finally, I, just last year, I moved into the open source programs office and uh, started working on the Google Summer of Code program. So um, I, I have all of the habits that I'm going to talk about here today are things that I have at one point or another discovered or done myself and realized that they were um, probably mistakes. <laughs> um, and also, this, this talk is sort of intended for the project managers in the world, but I also think that uh, being an engineer and having a perspective on uh, what the project managers are trying to do and whether or not they're actually effectively doing it um, is kind of a, a, an interesting and different perspective. And, and hopefully, even if you're not a project manager, you might get something out of this. So, um, with that, the first habit of highly ineffective project managers, uh, spend more than two hours per week in meetings going over the project with the engineers. Um, my general rule of thumb is you do not get more than two hours per week with any engineer about any project. Um, if you're spending more than two hours per week in meetings, um, you're probably not actually working on the project anymore. You're probably just talking about working on the project. Um, I don't know, has, any, has anybody here read the maker's schedule versus manager's schedule? Um, yeah, it's an article. I have a, I have a link to it at the end of this presentation, but it's an article by Paul Graham, um, and it's absolutely insightful, and I would recommend you all um, look into it. Um, he, has, he espouses this concept of basically um, the maker, the engineer um, in this case, is somebody who has to, um, by, by the very virtue of the work that they do, sit down and have time to get into the zone and, and work on something for an indefinite period of time. Um, and and it's, not, it, it's by definition not interrupt driven. You have to work on one thing at a time. And it, and, it even, it takes, and it takes time to context switch as well. So you can work on one thing for four hours and then you need time to actually change gears and work on, on something different in a different context. Whereas managers um, work 
in entirely the opposite way. Uh, we work on sort of an hour by hour schedule. We're constantly trying to switch context, although we're probably not doing a very good job of it. Um, and you know, I could be in a meeting with, uh, with my manager in one hour, and then I could be in a meeting with an engineer in the next hour, and then I could be uh, trying to actually move a schedule along in the next hour, and we're constantly interrupt driven. And this kind of inherently uh, puts us at, at odds with each other, um, because we're trying to get information, as project managers, we're trying to get information about the project and, and move the project along, and engineers are trying very hard to actually work on things and not talk to anybody else and actually do things. Um, and so this inherently kind of um, put, puts us at odds. Um, so this is this is why I have a general rule of thumb of having no no more than two hours per week in meetings, um, because as a project we we we, ha we have to find a balance. And as a project manager, I have to understand where the project is and how things are going. Um, but I also have to leave leave the engineer that I'm working with to to their their make time and to be able to actually work on the project. Um, I, I have had uh, many points in my in my career where I, I'm spending 20 to 30 hours per week in meetings of various sorts, and um, it kind of makes kind of makes you wonder at that point what are we actually doing except just talking about what we're doing. Um, and I, I say here at the end, ask yourself if you're empowered to do your job. Um, I've discovered that if you're spending that much time in meetings talking about the project, maybe you don't actually have the um, the authority or uh, the, the, the empowerment to be able to actually um, effectively do your job. And what you're trying to do instead is just report to your upper level management about what's going on instead of actually doing anything. So uh, the second habit of highly ineffective project managers, <laughs> assume all the engineers you work with are purposefully trying to do a bad job and sabotage the project. Um, I don't actually think that most people go into the workday thinking, this person is trying to sabotage this project. But what I do think that a lot of people do is that they kind of assume incompetence. Um, maybe maybe subconsciously, partially. Um, but they'll go into a, a project or, or, or um, asking about how, how is this particular task going or that sort of thing. Um, and you're asking because you're ki kind of subconsciously assuming that the person isn't going to be doing as well as you could be doing on it. Um, and so therefore, you kind of want to want to keep a, a very close eye on it and, and almost sort of micromanage it. Um, and I found that people inherently want to take pride in their, their work. They want to do a good job. People don't go into, the, into work in the morning thinking, I'm going to do terribly on this. Um, what they go into work doing, thinking is, I want to I wanna produce the best code that I can. I want to produce quality work here. And I want to take pride in it. And that takes time. And uh, we have to accept that, that that's OK, and, um, and adjust for that and allow for that in our schedules. And assume that, that even if that, per, you know, that engineer hasn't reported to you in the last 24 hours about how something is going, it's probably because they're working on it and trying to do a good job. It's not because they're, um, they're, they've thrown it off their radar and they're not working on it anymore. Um, and so I have found that, that in general, if you just as assume that somebody is actually going to do a good job and give them the time and the space to do it, um, you get much better results and a much better um, response to, to your work style. So uh, habit three, uh, keep a checklist. Um, this can take a lot of different forms. Um, the, I think the most common form is that a new project manager to, to a, a new project will decide, OK, I'm going to do a really good job on managing this project. And they produce this huge spreadsheet with really nice Gantt chart. And they've got all these tasks, and they've got all these details, and they've got dependencies, and it's all laid out. And it's you know, seven pages long, and it, and it fits an entire wall. And then they go, OK, great. Now I've got this project in, plan in place. Now what I'm going to do is go to task one and ask the engineer, is it done yet? And then I'm going to go to task two and ask the engineer, is it done yet? And then they say no, and you say, OK, that's fine. We've, we've, we've got slush in our schedule. I'll come tomorrow, and I'll ask you if it's done yet. Um, so uh, constant pings to an engineer about when a task is done does not project management make. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sorry? Yes, you're right. OK. Um, and, and also, in, in sort of uh, in tandem with this, um, the other problem with you know, be, the, this sort of scenario that I'm describing of being a new project manager to, to a new project is often you, you might not have the technical chops to be able to have 
a coherent conversation with the engineer about how the project is actually going. Um, unfortunately, I have discovered, and I think this is, this is universal at a lot of corporations, a lot of companies, a lot of organizations, a lot of projects, that the project manager is somebody who's really good at tasks and deadlines and, and that sort of thing, and they might not be the most technical person on the project. And so when an engineer says to you, the tests aren't running the way they're supposed to, the project manager hears blah, 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 when is it going to be done? Um, and what you really want to be doing is having a adult conversation with them about, okay, the tests aren't running correctly. What is, you know, what is your plan to, to get them working correctly? And I'm not suggesting here that the project managers have to be as technical as the engineers. I am certainly not. I couldn't code my way out of a paper bag. But you do have to be able to have a conversation with the person about how it's going and why it's not going well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so be familiar enough with the project and, and the, the technical details of the project to be able to have a conversation about, okay, let's try and work together to find solutions to, to get this back on, on track, uh, make, this work, make this work better, better you know, what can we do, and, and be able to have that conversation. Um, that's pretty much the first step. And also, um, you, you can be the project manager who has that nice big, big checklist and the big Gantt chart and that sort of thing, but my suggestion would be don't share it with the engineer. <laughs> First of all, they probably don't care. Um, but second of all, it's, you know, that's, that's for the project manager to, to be able to basically track their lives. It's not for the engineer to have to keep reporting to you on how task seven is going. Um, they're going to they're gonna work on, on their stuff, and, and they will have, you know, that hour per week when you get to ask them how things are going, and then you leave it there. So, uh, fourth habit of highly ineffective project managers. <laughs> Uh, let your middle and senior level managers meddle with the timeline and the goals of the project whenever they see fit. Extra credit um, if, you, if the managers confuse, you, uh, confuse your engineers about what your, your part of the project is. Um, I'm just actually going to forward it along because um, it's human nature to, to if, you are, if you are this middle level manager who's got a project manager under you and a whole bunch of, of engineers under you as well, um, it, your neck is on the line here if something goes wrong with that project. And so it's human nature to want to meddle and to talk to the engineers and say, how is this going? Is, is Carol managing this project the way you were hoping to, it, she would? Or is she doing a good job? Um, are, are you sure that this can't be done next week? Um, <laughs> and um, so I, what I have found uh, to sort of head this off at the past is maintain a credibility and, a, your, and authority as a project manager on the project from the get-go with your managers. Make sure that they understand that you, are, you, you, will, you will deliver what you've, you've said you will and that you'll do it on time and under budget um, and, and, and prove that to them and they will be less inclined to want to meddle because they'll start to trust you. Um, and, you know, it takes a while to, to establish this credibility, fair enough, um, but if, if you are constantly having that conversation um, in different ways about, yes, I am, I am qualified and competent to be able to manage this project and I have rapport with the engineers and they trust me and I trust them and when they tell me that something is going to be delivered, that it will be, and then you deliver that project, um, then everybody's happier and the managers don't feel like they have to come in and start talking. I mean, I, I'm sure everyone in this room has had, a, had an experience where you talk to a project manager about a deadline and then a week later their boss comes and says, hey, are you sure about that? Um, and that's probably uh, a, really, a really great way to, way to sabotage the project incredibly quickly <laughs> is for the engineer to be having seven conversations with seven different people about one deadline that they're not, that they have to explain over and over again. Um, so, fifth habit of highly ineffective project managers, uh, make everything an emergency. Um, it is, um, especially in an organization where you've got a hundred high priority bugs that all have to be done tomorrow, it's really easy to say, oh my god, everything has to be, has to be done right now and, and you need to stay up late coding this extra feature because, because the clients and the customers are, are going to die without it tomorrow. Um, and um, Inevitably, that's almost never the case. Um, but in general, um, I have discovered that if you don't cry wolf, you don't call things an emergency that aren't, and if you do call something an emergency, that the engineers will trust you because you, they know that when you do say it, that you actually mean it, that yes, this actually has to be delivered tomorrow because this is going to turn off the internet if we don't deliver it. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Um, and again, this is, this is one of those things where you have to establish rapport and credibility very early on in the project and, and keep working at, at maintaining that rapport because, um, because as soon as you, you listen to a manager tell you that um, this has to be done tomorrow and then you deliver it for the client and the client says, oh, we didn't need that. And actually what we wanted was this and could we have that tomorrow instead, um, then you've lost all your rapport and credibility and uh, yeah, good, goodbye project and goodbye you know, relationship uh, with your engineer. So uh, sixth habit of uh, highly ineffective project managers, and I've talked a little bit about this before um, already, but um, break down rapport with your engineers whenever possible. Um, I actually, I really like the converse of this because um, this, this I think is really sort of the crux of the, of the whole thing. If you are somebody that, if you are a, a coworker, regardless of whether you're a project manager or not, that people can approach and trust and you're sensible and logical, um, people will, will, will want to work with you. And if you are somebody who's constantly saying everything's an emergency and it, and I think by, by essence sort of lying about what's important, what your goals are, what's important on the project, that sort of thing, um, people are not going to want to work with you and uh, it, it's, it's not, just not going to work out. Um, I, my personal way that I build rapport and credibility with engineers is I bake cookies. <laughs> I have discovered that this gets me very far <laughs> with engineers. Um, you might have a different, a different way of, of establishing and, and maintaining rapport, but um, I, on a pretty much weekly basis, bring in cookies into the office, or baked goods of some sort. Um, and uh, it's amazing the things that you can have, get people to do, or at, not even get people to do. It's amazing the, the, the trust that people will instill in you if you, if you actually uh, go out of your way to do something for them first. Yeah? I, I did it with a project manager, and she gave us like little, little, um, little pieces of chocolate after we did something. Yeah. But it was so pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, she thought we could be bought that cheap. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, so so actually, I, I actually don't think that that's a good approach to it. I, th I found that the way to do it is to do it regardless of what the people are doing. Whether you think they're doing well on the project or doing horribly, bring in cookies every week. Um, and, and then it's not, it's not, I'm tying a reward to, to this thing that you, my monkey is doing. It's, I, it's, it's I'm, I'm doing something nice for my coworkers. And they, and, they, and they see you as somebody who does a favor for, for your friends, hopefully. I mean, you see them as friends. Um, as opposed to, hey, monkey, thank you for doing a good job. Here's a piece of chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. I absolutely agree. Um, and, and, um, and, People, people know the difference inherently. I mean, e even if you don't say it that way, pe people can tell. Um, and my final point is, um, it takes most people time to feel comfortable with their coworkers. My, my discovery in the last few years has been, it takes even more time for engineers to feel comfortable with, with most people. So, um, so again, this is, this is a process that takes time and effort, but um, you will be handsomely rewarded if you're willing to put the time and effort in, because I've found that uh, engineers are willing to go to the ends of the earth for you to try, try and help you um, when, they, when they trust you and, they, and you say, oh my god, please help me with this. Uh, I'm going to be fired tomorrow if I don't get this feature in for this client. Um, and I've, I've discovered that engineers are, are wonderful people um, when, you, when you have rapport and credibility with them. Um, and the final habit of highly ineffective project managers. <laughs> um, <laughs> assume that the dates the engineers give you are spot on and make promises to clients and customers based on those dates. Um, this might actually sound like I'm telling, saying uh, don't trust the engineers. In fact, I'm actually saying the reverse. I'm saying that um, engineers are people and that they want to give you a date that will get the response of, wow, I didn't know it would, it, you could do it quick, that quickly, not, wow, I didn't realize it would take you that long. Um, and so it, it, anybody who's trying to give you a deadline or a deliverable is going to, in, in, in essence, basically try and tell you that they're going to do a good job and they're going to do it quickly. Um, and so, how, in general, having the response regardless of the date that they give you and saying, wow, thanks for doing it that quickly is, is always a good plan. Um, and also, knowing the people that you're talking to well enough to know whether or not they're going to uh, be adding their own padding as well, um, based on you know, things you've seen them deliver in the past and whether or not they've actually de delivered that quicker than they always said they would or whether or not things they've delivered in the past they've delivered slower than they said they would and, and be able to do that calculation on the fly. Um, and also, um, 
as the project manager, you are in the position of, the, of being the person who makes the, makes the promises and, and talks to the customers and the clients and, and upper level, level management. And it is your job to, to basically say, OK, the engineer told me it's going to take two weeks. Excuse me, I think it's going to take two weeks and three days. And therefore, I'll tell them that it's going to be delivered in three weeks. And if you underpromise and overdeliver, I think that's a, gen a, a good general rule of thumb for, for most of life. <laughs> if you uh, underpromise and overdeliver, everyone will always be happy. And then if you underpromise and just deliver on time, it's still okay instead of um, underpromising and under underdelivering. Um, so with that, I have some special thanks. Uh, Stephen Covey, who I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, with the seven habits of highly ineffective speakers, uh, highly ineffective, highly effective people. Sorry, it's Friday. Um, Josh Berkus, um, who some of you may know, um, he d gave a talk at Open Source Bridge last year. He gave me the idea for the highly ineffective concept. He did a, a, a little talk on the seven habits of highly ineffective speakers. Um, and then Paul Graham, this is, this is the link I was telling you about earlier. I would really would suggest that you all read this article. It's, it's absolutely insightful, uh, the maker schedule versus manager's schedule. So with that, are there any questions? Yes? Um, a couple of related, couple of related questions. Mm -hmm. As the project manager, um, frequently, you're not in charge of carrots and sticks, mm -hmm. and so you have no way of really rewarding your engineers or to punishing them in any way. And also, you are completely powerless in a, uh, when a manager de decides that something's an emergency. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I guess most project managers and most people who have managed projects, you know, are, are kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I would like to hear your thoughts on how to deal with that rock and a hard place. Well, related to the cookies thing, in terms of the carrots and stick thing, you're right. There's a lot of, a lot of companies and, and organizations that function that basically you're, you're in this middle position where you don't get to offer the carrots and the sticks. But if you start to implement your own carrots, regardless of what the management will let you, um, then, then I think people will start to, to, to listen to you more even though you may not necessarily be the end all be all for, okay, I can't change your pay grade, um, but I can still give you cookies on Fridays. Um, and, I, you know, and I think... Uh, no, it's, yeah, exactly. If it's not tied to performance. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, if, if, if we don't deliver this project on time and somebody cuts your salary by 10%, you're right. Like, I, didn't, I don't have any control over that. Um, but I, I can do my best to try, try and implement my own carrots and sticks Within, in the, in the, within the constructs of my relationship with the engineer. Um, related to the, to the um, managers can, can just say it's emer an emergency immediately. Um, and it, as well as, as establishing rapport with the engineers that you're working with, I think establishing rapport with management as well is really important. And, and managing upward and, and it, establishing yourself as the person that, if I say that this project will be done by March 31st, that it's done by March 31st, I think management's a little less um, inclined to, to say everything's an emergency because they trust your opinion. And they're, they're also, you know, if, if it really is one of those things where the manager says, no, we have to have this tomorrow, if you already have that, that respect in place with the engineer and you say, no, we have to have this tomorrow, they understand it's not coming from you, it's coming from the corporation and, and that's just the way it has to go. Um, and, you know, I mean, goodwill is meant to be spent sometimes and sometimes you have to do that. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, so back to the same question about carrots and sticks. Um, I work on the designs and requirements analysis side of things and quite often when I work with a project manager, my issue is that I'm telling either management or project management that they can't have the toys, that mm -hmm. we can't get everything in to scope or mm -hmm. we're going to have to cut stuff out. So the idea that my project manager could be directly responsible for, you know, um, reviewing my performance. That can sometimes be at odds. So, oh, yeah. yeah, having the having the um, you know the management position also be the project management position can be problematic. So, I absolutely, yeah. I absolutely agree. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't want to be so, I, the boss of anybody. <laughs> mm. I, I just want to be somebody who says I, I can have, I can be the, I can be the glue. I can talk to management and I can talk to the engineers and I can try and make this all cohesive little thing. Yeah. And the other thing to probably add to your point about um, if you're wanting to be really ineffective, make sure that you have management get involved in interviewing all of the engineers yeah. to see how that goes. <laughs> Same goes for if you've got like leads in different, in a project team. Mm -hmm. Like I'll typically have eight 
different analysts and um, working for me and so I get really pissed if the project manager goes to all of my seven little guys oh, and yeah. says so how are we going with that oh yeah uh, and especially if you if you have a larger PMO or uh, organiza in your organization where you have multiple project managers that, that have to work with each other yeah meddling in some other project managers uh, deal is just as bad as having the management meddle I mean you have to assume in addition to the engineers are competent, that your fellow project managers are competent too and that they, they know what they're doing as well. You said earlier on that basically, um, uh, uh, what was it, under promise and over deliver is generally a good strategy for everything. Um, humbly but fundamentally, I really, really disagree. Okay. Uh, because um, I think that an and I think, by the way, this is not your fault, but it's an issue in corporate culture, mm -hmm. that an organization which rewards people for over-delivering basically entices people to pad on anything that they ever estimate. And a much better strategy is to basically um, reward a spot-on delivery mm -hmm. and sort of you know, discourage um, a deviation in the positive or in the negative mm -hmm. from that. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think that's an, uh, I think that is a good strategy. Um, I, I guess I wish that more organizations had sort of an incentive structure for that. Um, oops. Um, where, whereas I think that um, inherently, if, if somebody says it's, it's going to be delivered on March 31st and it's delivered on March 21st and everybody's happy, if it's delivered on March 31st and then it's delivered on, you say it's going to be delivered on March 31st and then it's delivered on March 31st, everybody says, oh, okay, great. Um, that was kind of underwhelming. Um, I, I, guess, I, I guess maybe um, I, I, I think that's a, a fundamentally different um, approach than we currently have to to how we manage projects um, and and you know how we kind of run run our corporations I guess um, it, I I actually think that that's a, that's a very good point um, I don't know how we would implement that though. <laughs> Yeah. Um, uh, actually, you've missed the one point that I find the most annoying as a person doing the work. Please tell me. I, I, really, I really do like hearing this. Um, it's like I've got a job where I've said it will take X amount of time. Project person comes back to me, oh, we can add XYZ feature. Finish on the same deadline. Okay. Yeah, let's go that, creep. Yeah. <laughs> that's added another two weeks to the project. Um, with that one where the person said about finishing on time, I will tell you this now, it's better to reward people to finish early, even if they're padding. Because if I've padded and I've got to finish and I'm going to be rewarded for finishing on a particular day, there's a thousand things I can come up with to delay my time to mm -hmm. actually make it so it appears that I've hit the schedule <laughs> dead on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, th I think there are a lot of people who are, who are procrastinators as well. I mean, I am certainly one of them, so I will wait until the very last minute to do anything. And if I said it will be delivered on March 31st, I'll deliver it on March 31st at 9 a.m. and not a minute before. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah. Previous slide. Right. Um, the one problem that we've had in our organisation is that the uh, project managers have had a lot less backbone than those management above them. And is there anything we can do? Uh, I'm on the engineer level. Is there anything we can do to encourage the programmers? Uh, sorry, the project managers to actually stick up against those management and do their job properly. My, my suspicion when, you, when I hear that is that the, that the managers, the, the managers, the management is, is holding something over the project managers and basically say, not empowering them to actually do their job. And so the project managers, instead of feeling like they have, they have authority or feel like they're just kind of um, in, it, a, between a rock and a hard place. Um, can you can you give? I was actually could, I'm, I'd hate to ask for the microphone back, but I'm curious if you have like an example of a time when a project manager didn't stick up for something. Uh, um, pretty much because they knew that they would be ripped off the project. They didn't. Um, yeah, it got. Um, it got to the point with one of our projects that uh, they were threatened to be removed from the project if they didn't change everything to match the management's deadline. So you're right; it's yeah. a lack of empowering. Yeah. Thing. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it sounds it sounds like it's not it's not a project manager problem; it's a management problem. Agreed. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but how do we solve that? Any hints? Um, uh, I I again I I mean I think I think that we need to encourage a a. Uh, a culture in our organizations of, of assuming competence and, and respecting each other 
And if you know, if if my pro if I put somebody on a project as a project manager, that I assume that they are competent and to do their job until they prove otherwise. Um, and I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's a difference in culture uh, with the management structure of of a, of a corporation. Um, but it, darn it, we should do it. <laughs> Uh, on the how to hit the deadline, uh, I work an operational team that does a lot of project work. We have problems when people deliver early because really? we're not ready for them. Like mm -hmm. they told us it would be first of May, we're gearing up for everything first of May. Mm -hmm. They deliver two weeks early, and we're going. Well, we're still training the service desk. We're still training, and they go, we literally tell them, okay, just sit on it, test it for yeah. a couple of weeks. So there is. Like there are certain building blocks that you simply can walk forward on. Mm -hmm. So if it's A, B, C, D, you deliver them in order, you're okay. But there are certain milestones, you know, mm -hmm. the difference between milestones and tasks, where you really can't deliver them early without affecting everyone else's schedules. I, yes, this is true. There are there are some things when you when you do actually have to just deliver it exactly on time. Um, I've discovered though that a lot of these things, it's not harmful to deliver them early, but it is harmful to deliver them late. Um, and so, and so, whereas sitting on something, a feature for an extra week, is, is not hurting anything. If it, ha, waiting for a feature for a week is is probably harmful. Although you're right, there are absolutely things for which they have to be delivered on on the spot. In which case, that again is the project manager's job to be able to to make that decision and and, and make those judgments. Hi. Um, hi. I'm just wondering if you've had. Um, have you, have you seen much in the way of uh, dates that seem to be rather arbitrary and they're not actually, someone just pulled it out of thin air, that's, uh, that's what they want on a particular date? I have, I have a lot. And I, and I, think, uh, I think that, again, is, is a matter of knowing the people that you're working with and so being able to say, um, it, well, first of all, be, uh, having the, the backbone to be able to go back to that person and say, have a conversation with them about, hey, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I, I kind of understand the technical details, but can you explain to me where, where this data is coming from sort of thing? And also, be, uh, conversely, being able to look at a date and say, Jim always pads things by two weeks, and he's just padded this by three weeks this time. So fair enough. I understand. I'm walking up the chain. It's got some <laughs> problem of um, not conveying the constraints properly on, on particular items. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a situation where someone on support said, oh, I want to get this done today. Just, just because he wanted, he just thought it was a good idea. It was some sort of initiative of his and meanwhile I'm, I'm burning and, and trying to get all this stuff done and ca causing heaps of technical debt just because he wanted to get it done today. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think um, I think knowing your coworkers and, and being able to have a conversation with them and, and take them out to lunch and say, hey, you know, marketing guy, I'm not so sure about this date that, that you just produced. Could you talk to me a little bit more about it? And suddenly it comes out that, oh, no, I just wanted it done today. You say, OK, that's, that's, that's great. I'm glad to hear that. Is it possible that we cannot do it for another two weeks? <laughs> and there's uh, quite a big queue of questioners. I've got one here, one there, one there. And then you two over there, and by that time, I'll have to uh, recount. <laughs> what about um, managing external, like uh, outsourced components, where project manager has no way to influence contract? And also, something else I've seen lately is people relying on an open source project that they're not involved in the governance of, they're not sponsoring or supporting. They're just kind of assuming these free people will do their job for them. Uh, Yes, I mean there are some, there yeah there are some cases where you just have to kind of assume that somebody's actually going going to do your job, but that kind of goes back to the assume competence. Assume that if 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 you've had some meeting where where this outsourced component said, okay, we're going to deliver by this date, um, and you're not quite sure that they're actually going to do it, but you should gener generally approach that situation and assume that they will unless they've proven otherwise. And if they've proven otherwise, then you have a case to go back to them and say, hey, you didn't deliver X by this date. Um, we need to have a conversation about about how you're working, um, but again, I mean, I think it comes back to relationships. I mean, you have you have to be okay with having a conversation with with those people and and saying, where are you guys getting these dates from, and and is uh, and is this even realistic? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, what do you? stand on um, issues where there's teamwork problems. I mean, there's two members of the team that don't get on at all. 
what do you see the project manager's role in that sort of situation? Um, well, uh, going back to the, I don't want to be the boss of anybody. Um, I, I don't want to have to be the person who works out personnel issues. Having said that, um, that can affect the project itself and two people not being able to work together on a particular feature might actually delay the project. Um, I, think, I think it comes, it's a question of how much of this is, is a personal problem and how much of this is actually going to affect the project. And, and being familiar enough with the project to be able to say, okay, this person has this part of this feature that they need to code, and this person has this part of this feature that they need to code. And do I think that they can realistically talk to each other enough to be able to make these two things to go, go together, or do I need to pull them aside and have a conversation and, and basically put them both on the spot and say, are you guys going to be able to deliver this and have them both look at me and say yes, in which case, okay, you guys are going to have to work out your issues. Um, but I, I try to, as, as much as possible, avoid having to get into the nitty gritty of, of dealing with personalities, um, mostly because, again, I don't have a carrot and a stick. I can't tell you that if you guys don't work together on this feature that I'm going to lower your pay by 10%. Um, all I can do is look you both in the eye and say, can you guys deliver this or do we need to figure out a different solution? And also being willing to find the different solution if you need to. Um, in the last uh, bunch of job interviews I've been in, I'd specifically ask uh, the manager, um, how do they obtain project status? And mm -hmm. if they give me an answer of, oh, I just ask everyone, <laughs> then I know that they're not very good. The other thing I'd do is... I um, just send them an email every day <laughs> with the same text. I'd, I'd point to a random person in the interview and, uh, and ask that manager when was the last time they took time off. <laughs> and if they can't answer that, then... I get a fair indication of how good they are. Oh, yeah. No, I, I yeah, absolutely. When was the last time I took? I took time off in December, so I don't feel bad about that. <laughs> um, but, yeah, actually, I mean, well, I think that's uh, true across the board. I think the people that are work, working themselves to burnout, regardless of what position they're in, are the ones who are, are probably not going to be able to deliver things as quickly and are not going to be as happy with their work and not going to be as fun to work with either. Hi. Um, one you might have missed, but it might be covered by other ones in there, is what a group of us referred to as the dipping bird project manager, okay. where you take the bird and you stick it in front of the glass and it'll go all the way down and sit there for a while and then come all the way back, <laughs> where there's you know one particular set of specs and we're doing that 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 and time comes for delivery and the squeaky wheel starts making it noise oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. We're doing this until the squeaky wheel's happy. Yeah, and then they go And then way. you're back to doing this and this and this. And um, a lot of that terrible. is... terrible. <laughs> it doesn't get yeah. anything done. <laughs> and a lot of that is the verbal. There's no actual ever written, any written change. It's a verbal, you know, we need to have a team meeting. Look, we're too busy. Nobody take minutes. We just need to get this sorted out. We're doing yeah. this. I, you know, I think that's actually related to the person not actually taking pride in the work they're doing, that they're not actually enjoying their job, and so they're basically doing this the tiny bit of work that they have to do when they're under deadline in order to get their paycheck, yeah. and they're not actually actually interested in the project or the people that they're working with or any, anything like that. It's really unfortunate, um, and I, it's pervasive as well. Hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> So the question I've got is, how do you deal with underperformers? So uh, in my particular situation, I've got a project manager who's not really doing the job and they've deferred to me being the technical lead. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've got a guy who's given me some estimates who are, which are clearly bloated. And, um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and forums are really, really attractive to him. Yeah. And, he's, and I'm sure he's going to make his deadline, but it's, you know, it's, there's a fair bit of fat there. And so how do I deal? I mean, I'm not... I'm even further away from the whole um, remuneration side of things. So how do I, how do I get this guy? And anyway, what are your thoughts on that to, to to get him in line? Well, so if, if he if he is actually still delivering everything that he says he's going to deliver, and he's just you just know that it's basically he's not working to his full potential. Um, that's kind of a, an interest. I mean, if it's if he truly is underperforming, if he's say, if he's saying that things he's going to deliver things and he's not actually delivering things, then, then you have you have actual. Um, you, an actual thing you can point to and say, no, you actually didn't do this. Um, if, if you think he's just not working to his potential, then maybe that's a conversation to have with his manager. Um, and, and it, you know, nothing, you know, not formal, not I think this person should be fired, but basically just I feel like we could be, we could be here with this project and we're here with this project because 
Michael is, is only working to 70% of, of his capabilities. And oh, by the way, here's this list of, of things that I wish we could be doing right now that Michael could be working on, um, and he's not. Um, and, uh, and you know, approach Michael and say, hey, this list of things that you could be working on that you're not right now, why don't you work on these things as well and see what he says. See, see if he says, no, I'd rather be looking at Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if he agrees to take all those things on, then, then you know, maybe, maybe he's only looking at Facebook because he doesn't feel like he has enough work to do. I guess that's possible. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, in smaller companies or maybe startup companies where a person does a lot more than just do project management, for example, he might be a project manager but do some coding as well, or he might be part of the management structure or whatever. Do you think the same dynamics are at play, and how do you sort of relate to that in, where in a big corporation where you've got more set out structures or more clearly defined structures? Um, so let me see if I understand your question correctly. So you're basically saying that in a large organization where there's basically multiple project managers and then multiple managers above them, there's kind of all of these different hand, hands in, in, the, in the project and, and there sort of isn't one, one person who um, sort of takes authority for it. And it, it, am I phrasing? Yes, that's pretty much what I'm asking. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think each individual project manager needs to own whatever it is that they're they're working on and 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 basically and put themselves have some backbone um, and put themselves up and say that this is what I'm responsible for this this is my set of projects um, and get them all to work together and also you know I mean I think it's it's also a good thing for engineers to push back and say Get, get your seven project managers in a room and say, you're all telling me that this is due on a different date. Can you guys figure out what your story is? Because <laughs> I want to work here. <laughs> and you guys can't actually all deliver me a similar story. Um, I mean, managing upward, if you're an engineer in that situation, is, is probably a, a good course of action. Um, take them all out to lunch and say, hey, can you all compare project plans and actually make one of them and then come back to me with what the actual real project plan is and then I'll start working, please? <laughs> A comment on formation of deadlines. Mm -hmm. Where I work, it, it's pretty good. And one of the things that works very well is the information flow. They will actually tell us this has to be due on this date because this project starts on this date and yeah. these guys. And often it's a matter of they will say, okay, you've, you've given us that two weeks, you could do that, can you do it in one? And they say, what can we drop for you? Like literally it's a push yes. and you, you go both ways. So that if the guy's on Facebook and he says two weeks and he does it in two weeks, that's not a failure of that person. He's basically found that he can do the job in two, two weeks, weeks and, look at and he has a nice work-life balance, whatever. So <laughs> it's up to the... But no, seriously, it's up to the PM to say, no, no, we need more out of you on this occasion. Can yep. you do it in a week? Okay. And if you make it clear, you know, we want you to not do Facebook for a week, can you do it? And he goes, okay, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, but exactly. if you don't have that conversation, yes. he just keeps doing the two weeks and he's happy. Yeah, and exactly. it's not his I mean, fault. Yeah, you give, him, give him the opportunity to say, yes, I can implement all these features. Why didn't you tell me about all these features you wanted me to implement? I was just looking at Facebook because I didn't have anything to do. Um, certainly, yeah, again, assume competence. Assume that the people will, will do if you just talk to them about it. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yeah. Who are the best people to perform the triage, you think, in a project? Uh, I, do you mean like uh, triaging a bug queue? Uh, I, I find that there's like almost a spectrum of things that can be changed, but um, I was on a project recently where I would try and give feedback. My, my job was to give lots of feedback, and I said, look, I, I'm thinking about making this decision here, but the manager said, no, no, keep the quality into it, just, just stretch it out a bit longer, and I was surprised at that. I thought, oh. I'm, I'm really glad I let him make that decision. I gave him the feedback, and, and so I'm just wondering if you've had anything like that. I, th I think it depends on how the organization is structured. Um, it, it sounds like th this manager is somebody who's pretty familiar with with what's going on be below him or her, and so he 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 can make those sorts of decisions on the fly and say, no, actually, that's not quite as important. Um, in sort of these larger organizations where there's seven PMs and then there's seven managers above them, um, there's really nobody who has kind of a forest through the trees view of the entire thing. In which case, whoever does have the forest through the trees view is kind of the person who should who should make the triaging decisions. Um, I would hope that if if a project manager is is working in that sort of organization, that they're able. I mean, that's that's basically the the crux of a project manager's job is to be able to say, okay, each of these engineers is working on this individual thing, and being able to make those decisions of, okay, this is more important than this, and being able to, to trade off on the fly. 
Um, but again, it depends on how the organization is structured. It, it might be that there's three project managers who all report up to one manager, and that person is the one who can kind of say, okay, these different projects all fit together in this way, and this one's slightly more important this week because of the clients and that sort of thing. Time for just one more question. Um, this is more of a statement. It's kind of having worked in a place where we did 100 man person projects and we used to flagellate ourselves for being, for slipping a day mm -hmm. um, on the entire project. What you're talking about is fundamentally your organisation, organisational capability maturity model level. And you know, all of those things, in our case, because we worked in a bigger company whose CMM was much worse than our groups, it really is about the bottom level guys caring about everything in the rest of the organisation getting better. Yeah, and absolutely. It all comes from the bottom and we just push upwards mm -hmm. because there's more workers than managers. In the end, the managers have no choice. They've got to get work done. Yeah, uh, yeah. So and yeah, you know, in, in our case, we eventually, you know, had to have the project managers be us as well because that way we could make sure that we hit our schedules because we cared more about the schedules than the boss's 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 boss did. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and, and you, again, you want to take pride in your work. You want to deliver quality code. You want to do cool things. You want to be passionate about what you're working on. The managers don't necessarily, aren't necessarily passionate about that, that feature that you're coding. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. And darn it, we should implement this in every corporation. <laughs> you should all go off now and, and assume competence, be respectful, and be passionate about what you're doing. Well, speaking of being passionate, I'm sure it's a very passionate topic amongst uh, a wide variety of people here. So uh, will you all join with me in thanking Carol? Thank you. If you asked a question, I have a couple things up here you can come and get if, if you would like. So thank you.